This is the GIS News for Tuesday, August 27, 2024. I am Chrisanne Mitchell. In the headlines, House of Representative passes supplementary appropriations bill. Details to this story and more after the break. We're excited to introduce our new digital school uniform assistance program designed to make shopping for school supplies easier for you. In this video, we'll guide you through the simple steps to use your QR code grant voucher for school supplies and uniform products. So, let's get started. Successful recipients will receive a text message and or email from our processing provider, WePay. Applicants who do not receive a text or email can contact the Ministry of Education's Student Support Services Unit to find out if their application was successful. Applicants who receive a text or SMS message should have the following link on their phone. Please note that this is a text message and not a WhatsApp or other messaging services type communication. This is an example of what the text or SMS message will look like. Please note that you will need internet access to click the link in the text message to view your QR code. We highly recommend that you take a picture or screenshot of this QR code in the event that you do not have internet access while shopping. This is what the QR code will look like. For recipients who received an email, the format is quite similar, and this is what that email will look like. Please check for an email from support at wepaytoday.com. Please check your email's junk or spam folder as this communication may accidentally go to those folders. Once you receive your QR code, you can immediately begin shopping at the designated stores for your school supplies. To know the designated shopping areas in your community, you may contact the Student Support Services Unit at the Ministry of Education. Welcome back. Finance Minister Honorable Dennis Cornwall, with approval from the Governor General, presented the Supplementary Appropriations Bill 2024 to the lower house to secure an additional sum of $269,598,000 and 86 EC dollars to service the state of Grenada for the fiscal year 1st January to 31st December 2024. The supplementary appropriation bill is necessary to facilitate the country's response to Hurricane Beryl. Minister Cornwall outlined how the funds will be allocated. Some of 1.7 million is needed to replenish funds for the TMRE show community college to honor financial obligation made by the government in the fiscal year. A sum of 300,000 is required to increase the annual subvention for the new life organization. Cabinet approved an increase in the monthly subvention granted to Neuro from $75,000 to $100,000 commencing in the fiscal year 2024. This increase is necessary to support the organization, its funded program and operational costs, ensuring that they can continue to provide vocational training and support services. An amount of 1.5 million is required to provide financial support to the Guerrilla Conference Seven Day Adventist for the construction of the St. George's SD Primary School at Archibald Avenue, St. George. The fund is this fund will significantly contribute to the overall project costs of 4.2 million, ensuring development of state of the art <coughs> education facility. This modern, innovative, well equipped school will provide enhanced learning environment, incorporating advanced educational technologies and infrastructural improvements. 
The new facility aims to the new facility aims to support the academic and social development of students, meeting contemporary educational standards, and preparing for future challenges. The sum of five million dollars is needed to support the provision of uniforms, meals, furniture, and general school supplies to children for the re reopening of schools on the sister side of Kyle Piti Martinic and in St. Patrick, following the passage of Hurricane Bella. Ministry of Health. In the week of Hurricane Bell, the urgency to replace essential medical and office equipment must be recognized as a critical step in restoring health care services to the pre hurricane levels. Overall, five facilities sustained damage. Of this, four lost approximately 70% of their roof sheeting, coupled with broken windows and doors, while the facility pretty much lost its roof. Water ingress results in further damage and loss, particularly to that of medical and office equipment and other fixtures and furnishings. He explained that assessment of needs and other sectoral and ministerial evaluations were conducted to finalize the additional figure. Assessment of needs approved by the Finance Committee and the enactment of bill in Parliament, which includes a debate in the lower and upper houses of Parliament. The Senate is expected to debate the bill later this week. Parliamentary Representative Honorable Ron Redhead gave support to the bill. The appropriation bill gives, or rather this appropriation bill, gives the initial economic response by the government of Grenada to the monster that we have all come to know as Hurricane Bell. It focuses primarily on the short to medium term goals or responses that is required and does not seek to replace that long term goal of rebuilding Grenada as a resilient state. And let me just explain what I mean by that. Now, Hurricane Bell occurred on July 1st. The government of Grenada will have to respond. They have done a number of things. All of it is out there. The information is general. And therefore, the need for us now to begin to lay the structural foundation to rule out the response is what we must get to. So for example, as we discuss this budget, Mr. Speaker, where we sit, or at least where I sit, I see two main threats that loom on the horizon in the response to the aftermath of Bell. And one, we are still well within the hurricane season. So to say that we must just go berserk and just start to spend money and start to do all kinds of things without first looking at implications, without first managing and putting a system in place, is going to be careless. The Grenada Development Bank is establishing a satellite office in Karakou to administer the Business Reactivation Fund. The plan, as outlined by Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell and Finance Minister Honorable Dennis Cornwall, is part of support to businesses to rebuild and restore following Hurricane Beryl. GDB intends to employ personnel to work at the office to ensure the program is implemented seamlessly and successfully in September. Available positions include customer service representatives, administrative assistants, project loan officers, and finance officer. The bank is targeting residents of Karakou to fill the vacant positions. The satellite office will be established in Hillsborough and is scheduled to begin operations by the second week in September. During a meeting of the House of Representatives on Tuesday, Finance Minister Honorable Dennis Cornwall said repayments under the fund will be at 1% interest rate for a maximum of 10 years. The loan will be used for construction, capital goods, purchase, and working capital. The interest rate on this facility will be 1% collateral for these loans. Loans to be secured as far as possible by property, secondary mortgage, legal mortgage, sorry, cash and cash equivalents, liens, equipment, etc. Terms and grace period, a minimum, a maximum, sorry, of 10 years inclusive of one year grace period will be allowed and the, uh, the facility will begin from September 1st, 2024.
Member of Parliament for Karakou and Pizit Marknik, Honorable Tevin Andrews, says the rebuilding process in Karakou and Pizit Marknik has begun. He says government's focus remains on the recovery efforts following the devastation caused by Hurricane Beryl. He emphasized that government and the public must remain focused during this critical juncture. There's a time and a place for everything. This is certainly not the time for politics. This is a time for us to unite the people of Karakon Piti Matnik and for all hands to be on deck so that we can rebuild a more resilient Karakon Piti Matnik. So, Mr. Speaker, this supplemental budget is a budget that is designed for us to respond to the devastating impact of Hurricane Beryl. Mr. Speaker, I have absolutely no doubt that the people of Karakon and Piti Matnik and Karakon and Piti Matnik on a whole will rise from the ashes. We are, after all, a resilient people. History has taught us that. And the process has begun. So the Ministry of Environment, Minister, through Mr. Speaker, Minister James and her team, are working closely with our ministry, the Ministry of Caracol, PT Matnik Affairs and Local Government, to start the process of the conduct effort in Karakou. We have nine crews, seven in Karakou, two in Piti Matnik. And Mr. Speaker, if you visited Karakou, just before, just after, sorry, Beryl to now, you wouldn't think that a hurricane passed with the amount of debris that, um, that is no longer on the roadside and the street side and so on, because a clear effort is having significant progress, if you want to put it that way. The Ministry of Karakou and Petit Marketing Affairs will also collaborate with the Ministry of Climate Resilience to undertake a marine cleanup effort. In addition to that, another cleanup aspect that will be starting soon is the marine cleanup. All the wrecks, the yachts and boats that are, that are washed ashore, or st are stuck in the lagoon. The Ministry of Environment is assiduously putting plans in place, and that process should start in a couple, well, a couple of days if you want to put it that way. So again, another response that will assist us. Of course, we have to do it. We have to ensure that that is done because you don't want the oils and the gas from those vessels, those boats, to get into the water and have that uh, impact on our ecosystem or marine life. No one will be left behind with the rebuilding initiatives. This administration has proven itself time and time again whereby we made a statement and our actions speaks for itself. We have demonstrated with our initial response thus far that we are mindful of the seriousness and the situation in Karakon Piti Matnik and that we are taking this very seriously and that we recognize that it needs to, this needs to be an all-hands-on-deck approach. And that we are all in this together. And the fact that Prime Minister and his regional colleagues came to Karakou, and several delegations came to Karakou that have never been to Karakou before. Never heard of Karakou before, P.T. Matnik. It sends a signal that backs up what I've been saying, that no one will be left behind. Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell said of paramount importance is the upgrading of infrastructure on the sister isles to an appropriate building standard. Building codes will be reformed. We have to become, we have to operate less in silos and bring all the players together. And I know the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Character and Piti Matnik Affairs, the Planning and Development Authority, we all have to work together to ensure 
that the incentives, the tax incentives, the business reactivation, all the assistance that the government is giving will be linked to ensuring that we build back better and that we build resilience back into the physical infrastructure in Kaiko and Piti Matnik. If we don't do that, then we'll be wasting taxpayers' resources. So the building codes must and have to be enforced. There's no question about that. Uh, we are working with our partner, Sidema. A consultant has been offered to us to assist us in helping to straighten that process, Mr. Speaker, and we would gladly uh, accept the, the help that, that we've received. I Stay with us. We'll have more after the break. Are you unemployed or looking for a higher earning opportunity? Have you seen a sponsored advertisement on social media? Facebook in particular? Stop. Think about your next move. Things may just be about to take a turn for the worse. It may seem legit, but if it seems too good to be true, it definitely is. Look out for the following red flags. Does the company's name seem unusual or unfamiliar? Do your due diligence. Find out about your proposed new employer by doing your own research. Do not use a link given by the person. Are you required to give your banking and other personal details, full name, account number, telephone number, account type information? Are you being pressured to move with a sense of urgency? Are you required to send monies overseas? Does your pay or commission seem unusually high for the tasks required? Are communication done only through social media, direct messages, without any face-to-face -face or verbal communication? Is there a hesitancy or refusal to share basic company information, such as website or physical address? Are you being asked to click suspicious links to upload personal data? Do not get involved. You may be partnering with criminals or scammers in the commission of a crime, and you can be charged. Save yourself the embarrassment. Do not go down that road. Welcome back. Minister for Health Honorable Philip Tellisford says the ministry is on guard and ready to respond if an MPOX outbreak in Africa is discovered in North America, England or the Caribbean. Earlier this month, the World Health Organization declared this current outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. MPOX, formerly known as monkeypox, is an infectious disease caused by a virus. Flu-like symptoms, including fever, chills and muscle aches and are typically followed by a rash that starts as raised spots which turn into blisters filled with fluid. The Democratic Republic of Congo is experiencing a severe outbreak with more than 14,000 reported cases since the start of 2024. Outbreaks in the DRC are not unusual, but this year's figure already matches the total for the whole of 2023 and includes cases in previously unaffected provinces. This version of MPOX, known as MPOX clad 1B is more transmissible and can cause more severe illness than clad 2, which we saw in 2022. I'm saying this, Mr. Speaker, that we take cognizance of what is outside there. Currently, Mr. Speaker, there are no cases of clad 1B MPOX in Grenada or in the Caribbean. None has been reported in the USA, UK, Canada, and Latin America at the time as, as per my last update or my last briefing. Minister Tellisford noted that there is a limited number of travelers from the Congo to Grenada, therefore the risk for its spread is reasonably low. Lab staff at the General Hospital were trained by the Pan-American Health Organization in 2022 to conduct testing for the disease and public education and awareness efforts are continuing. So the Grenada Ministry of Health shall immediately step up surveillance and begin border security at our sea and airports should the disease be discovered in North America and England. 
Grenada received high commendations on its recognition of the World Trade Organization and its mission to improve trade and investment within the OECS following a recent visit by Deputy Director General Ms. Joanna Hill and Head of the OECS Mission in Geneva, His Excellency Colin Murdoch. The team visited Grenada on August 19th and traveled to St. Lucia on the 21st and held discussions with public and private sector officials as well as representatives of the OECS Commission on the WTO's Fisheries Subsidies Agreement, ongoing negotiations, trading services, investment facilitation for development, agriculture and food security, and the reform of the WTO's dispute settlement system. In Grenada, Ms. Hill met with Honorable Joseph Andal, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Trade and Export Development, Honorable Lennox Andrews, Minister for Economic Development, Planning, Agriculture and Lands, Forestry and Fisheries, among other officials. His Excellency Morda said the visit to Grenada augurs well for the development of both the country and the organization. He is optimistic that more development is on the way for Grenada. Grenada sees the WTO as being very relevant to its development and that there is a role for trade in development. Um, in fact, I think the minister uh, responsible for agriculture, Minister Andrew, in fact, I think he mentioned that uh, there is no development without trade and without export. And uh, I think um, I think that is that is so true. And so I see Grenada as being very focused on utilizing what the WTO has to offer, uh, not only in terms of technical assistance and capacity building, but also in terms of all the agreements that are already in play or that are being developed. And I think Grenada intends, along with the other ECS members, to play a constructive role in whether it is in e-commerce, whether it is in dispute settlement reform, or whether it is in FISH 2 or any of the other files, I think you will find that Grenada and OECS uh, intend to be positive and intend to be constructive. I think WTO will learn a lot about the actual nature of the OECS economies on the ground, practical uh, things. And I think OECS will also become more engaged and uh, fill in some of those gaps that we have in our engagement with the WTO, both in terms of, you know, the Secretariat and what is available from the Secretariat, but, and also in terms of the other members, the membership. I think we can achieve um, good things in those areas. The Deputy Director General highlighted some of the priority areas for Grenada and other OECS member states. Reform, uh, dispute settlement is something that's also a priority for our members. Um, at MC uh, 13, that was in Abu Dhabi this year, members also, with the full support of um, the OECS and CARICOM, put in the ministerial declaration uh, a paragraph calling on the importance of uh, promoting services trade because some economies are really strong in the services area, but want to take advantage even more of the opportunities in order to And so a paragraph was agreed to in the ministerial conference to give more attention to this work. And so uh, today we talked about some of the opportunities uh, that are coming up to work in this area. One is um, uh, and um, the the joint statement initiative agreement that came into effect in Abu Dhabi this year on services domestic regulation, which basically tries to make uh, the services environment uh, more predictable, more transparent, more stable, more efficient, so that services exporters will be more competitive abroad. And also it helps to attract uh, foreign investment in the services area. Uh, the other initiative is a joint project with the World Bank called Services Trade um, for Development. And in it, it diagnoses some of the many opportunities that developing countries have in services trade, but also recognizes the challenges that many of these economies have, and therefore proposes an aid for trade program 
that can help overcome those challenges. It has to do with data collection and statistics and services. Continuing the news, field officers from Extension, Agronomy, Forestry and Land Use have joined forces with the Pest Management Unit for a two-day training course focused on biological control methods for the croton scale insect. The training, which began on Monday at the Produce Chemist Laboratory, includes sessions on familiarizing with indigenous nat natural enemies, utilizing and multiplying these natural enemies, field surveillance and mass rearing of biological control agents. Since its emergence in 2020, the Croton scale insect has severely affected agricultural produce, particularly soursop and other fruits. However, the ministry has observed a decrease in affected crops over the past year and a half. The training conducted by CABI, Center for Agriculture and Bioscience International, aims to explore the factors behind this improvement. Plant Quarantine Officer Francis Noel explained that CABI is working to identify natural enemies that could potentially be reared commercially and distributed to further combat the pest. CABI is trying to benefit from our experience because right now the cotton scale is threatening um, Latin America and South America. So it's in Venezuela. So Brazil and some of the other countries, they are trying to take it and trying to learn from experience. So whatever is happening here, they want to know what is happening so at least they can benefit from it. So hence the reason why they are doing all this work, you know, trying to identify the natural enemy. We have a number of um, pest, um, beneficial insects that we would have identified. One is a wasp and one is a moth. So they have, they have, they have, they have um, extracted them from the lab they are going to have them identified and then we'll see how we can, if we can mass produce it. CABI representative Willie Cabrera Walsh stated that one of the key objectives of the training is to determine the factors responsible for the reduction in the impact of the Croton scale insect on the island and to capitalize on these findings. We are here to find what's eating it, what kind of insects, feed on it, attack it or parasitize it, and what kind of pathogens affect it too. The objective, the final objective is see if any biocontrol agents could be developed to control it. Biocontrol agents are insects or diseases that one can use instead of pesticides to control pests or weeds eventually too. The thing is that uh, there are I mean, there are many, many uh, agents attacking them, and many of them, or some of them at least, could suddenly be developed into, into something farmers could use all the time. Representatives from nearly all field divisions in the ministry are participating in the training. Acting District Extension Supervisor Dennis Batiste emphasized that extension officers and assistants, who are often the first to respond to farmers' concerns, are among the most crucial attendees. The extension officers are in the front line. They interact with the farmers on a daily basis. Um, in most cases, when the farmers encounter pest or disease problems, the first person that they go to persons would be the extension officers. So it's important that we keep our extension officers abreast with the new technologies, the, um, the pests and, the, and diseases that are around, and how are the best ways to treat them. Um, while we do that, we have to be mindful of the, of the environment. We want to make sure that we protect our environment. So we're trying to get away from too much of the harsh chemicals. So if you can get involved with uh, natural enemies, biopesticides, then it's a plus for us as a society. We'll have healthier foods, we'll end up having a healthier nation. The training will continue on Thursday with sessions for farmers. We'll have more after the break. We're excited to introduce our new digital school uniform assistance program designed to make shopping for school supplies easier for you. In this video, we'll guide you through the simple steps to use your QR code grant voucher for school supplies and uniform products. So let's get started. 
Successful recipients will receive a text message and or email from our processing provider, WePay. Applicants who do not receive a text or email can contact the Ministry of Education's Student Support Services Unit to find out if their application was successful. Applicants who receive a text or SMS message should have the following link on their phone. Please note that this is a text message and not a WhatsApp or other messaging services type communication. This is an example of what the text or SMS message will look like. Please note that you will need internet access to click the link in the text message to view your QR code. We highly recommend that you take a picture or screenshot of this QR code in the event that you do not have internet access while shopping. This is what the QR code will look like. For recipients who received an email, the format is quite similar and this is what that email will look like. Please check for an email from support at wepaytoday.com. Please check your email's junk or spam folder as this communication may accidentally go to those folders. Once you receive your QR code, you can immediately begin shopping at the designated stores for your school supplies. To know the designated shopping areas in your community, you may contact the Student Support Services Unit at the Ministry of Education. Welcome back. Director and pastor of His Grace Ministries, Leo Prince, made a donation of relief items to the National Disaster Management Agency, NADMA, on Tuesday for the Sister Isles of Karakou and Petit Martinique. Pastor Prince and his team visited the NADMA headquarters and presented the items to disaster coordinator, Dr. Terence Walters. They included water, paints, and school supplies, which addresses immediate and critical needs on the island. Uh, on behalf of our membership, our friends and our supporters, it gives us real joy to respond in a loving and tangible way to the needs that occur primarily in the Grenadines after the passing of Hurricane Beryl. So, Mr. Terence Walters, Director of the National Disaster Agency, it gives me a joy to present to you this morning 50 cases of water, 30 gallons of paint, one barrel of mixed clothing, 10 gallons of paint, 30 gallons of paint, buckets of nails, and two. Um, 10 gallons of disinfectant that can be used in the hospitals, in cargo and the clinics. And also we have one box of mold and mildew remover. And we have here for the preschools in cargo who may have lost uh, almost everything. We have a lot of teaching aids in a box there by way of felt. Uh, uh, so there are different ones there that can be used in the preschool. So Mr. Walters, on behalf of His Grace Ministries, it is a joy to present it to you with love. And Prince says his ministry will continue to stand with the people of Karakou and Petit Martinique. Love, and we stand ready again to respond even in a more tangible way. When some people will, they will have built back their homes and they need certain things, in mainly, maybe like beds and chest of drawers. We will be happy to make a response in that manner. So may God bless you as you continue to do this great work. National Disaster Coordinator Dr. Terence Walters thanked Pastor Prince and assured that the donation will be used to serve the people of Karakou and Petit Martinique. Thank you very much, Pastor Prince and His Grace Ministries, for your contribution to the uh, relief efforts uh, for Hurricane Beryl. We thank you and His Grace Ministries for your contribution and we assure you that uh, these items will be sent directly to the people of Karakou and Piti Martinique so that they can, uh, they can have it for use, the relief efforts and the, the recovery 
uh, after Hurricane Beryl. So the Ministry of Infrastructure, Public Utilities, Civil Aviation and Transportation says the Mongay Hospital Road will be closed to vehicular traffic from August 27, 2024 until further notice. This is necessary to facilitate the construction of a sewer line in the area. As such, the public is advised that traffic heading towards the area can utilize the Mount Rush Road route. We'll take a break and when we return, what's happening in sports? Welcome back. In sports this evening, on the 13 cricketers from the Windward Islands and Trinidad and Tobago will face each other in the final match of their inaugural series at Lasages Playing Field on Wednesday. Details in sports report by Leslie and Johnson. Trinidad and Tobago's under-13 cricket team won game two against the Windward Islands under-13 by five wickets in the inaugural Windward Islands vs. TNT under-13 tournament at the last suggest playing field on Monday. Trinidad and Tobago won the toss and elected to field. They bowled out their Windward's counterparts for 122 and in reply made 123 for five. The game's commentators say there is good prospect for the future of West Indies cricket by what they have seen from the young cricketers. Here is the final ball of the game. Driven. Uh, again, pass him in off, Fila. Uh, and uh, 
It was uh, Dante the Bongli for four. And certainly that's uh, the winning shot. 123 for four. Uh, full toss ball there. And Giuseppe driving straight down to mid off. A misfield by the mid off feeler. And it was Dante the Bongli for four. What a win by Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, really, really good outstanding cricket from them. They were on the early pressure and losing their top order for just 16 runs. But that partnership of 88 between guess, um, Thomas and uh, Mongru just brought everything back together. And so they, I think this is really where the, the game was won for Trinidad and Tobago. Had the Wilmots taken that chance to out, get Thomas out, it, the complex of the game may have been different. Yeah. But definitely um, a good victory, good mature cricket. Yeah, and uh, one has to come in the, the Trinidad team. I think they played well. They played better cricket. I think they bowled, they bowled well, having, having the ball first. Uh, really made it difficult for, for the Wilmots in terms of scoring. They had difficulty in scoring. And as such, I was able to, to bowl him out for 122, which, as we discussed earlier in our view, was, was not enough. But the winner did, as you said, made, made a good start to have them 16 for 3. But again, we saw some maturity. We saw as though there were some experienced players playing in, in the middle. And that pair batted really well to put on a partnership of 18. And all it meant was that just, just for them to complete, complete the victory. Well, well deserved victory. We have seen, in my view, we have seen some batting that, that speaks to, uh, to good prospect for the future. Uh, we have seen some leg spin that really, in my view, that uh, you know, can move on because of the consistency and how they bowl. And one have to give them a credit having uh, completed a, a very good victory, a convincing victory. In the first game on Saturday, reinforced the abandonment of play. The final game in the series will be played on Wednesday. In football, Paradise FC International turned out the highest goal score in Premier League matches held over the weekend with an 11-1 goal advantage over Montrich at Plains. In other matches, Hurricanes SC defeated Hard Rock 5-1 at the Alston George Park. Queen's Park Rangers FC beat Saab Spartans 4-0 at Queen's Park Shamrock SC defeated Fontenay United 3-1 at Boucheju and the match between FC Camahorn and St. John's Sports ended 1-0 at Queen's Park. After this round of matches, Paradise FC International has 21 points, followed by Hurricanes with 17 and Queen's Park Rangers 15. In one first division match played on Monday, North Stars defeated Sun Jets 7 goals to 2 in Rosehill. And going back to Premier League matches for this weekend, Queen's Park Rangers FC will face FC Camerhorn on Saturday at Queen's Park Ground 2 from 4 p.m. Fontenoy United will meet Mount Rich on Saturday at Boucheju, also at 4 p.m. On Sunday, Hurricanes SC will meet Paradise FC International at Alston George Park from 6 p.m. Also on Sunday, Shamrock SC will meet St. John's Sports at Plains from 4 p.m and Saab Spartans will meet Hard Rock at Victoria Park also from 4 p.m. The Grenada Senior Men's National Football Team is preparing for a round of matches in the CONCACAF Nations League. It runs from September 6th to 9th at the Kirani James Athletic Stadium. The CONCACAF Nations League is an international association football competition contested by the Senior Men's National Teams of CONCACAF Member Associations. CONCACAF is the regional governing body of North and Central America and the Caribbean. It comprises 41 member countries and Grenada is presently playing in League B of the competition. League B also includes St. Lucia, Curaçao and St. Martin. Para-athletes from Grenada and all over the world will be in action from Thursday, August 29th, just weeks after the 2024 Paris Olympics. The Paralympic Games will begin in Paris on Wednesday, August 28th and continue until Sunday, September 8th. About 4,400 athletes will compete across 20 venues during the Paralympics. They will participate in 23 disciplines. 
At the Olympics, roughly 10,500 athletes competed in 48 sports disciplines. Unlike during the Olympics, where competition began before the opening ceremony, the first day of the Paralympics features only the opening ceremony. Some events like para swimming, para table tennis, para sitting volleyball and para wheelchair basketball will take place over the course of almost the entire Paralympics. Grenadian athletes Aishana Charles and Tyler Smith are hoping to do Grenada proud at the Games. Charles is participating in her second Paralympic Games following her debut in the 2021 Tokyo Games. She will compete in the women's F46 javelin and F46 shot put. Tyler Smith will participate in the men's F43 shot put. The closing ceremony for the Paralympics will take place on September 8th. And that's the GIS Evening Sports. I'm Leslie Ann Johnson. Thank you, Leslie Ann. This brings us to the end of the GIS News for Tuesday, August 27, 2024. A recap of the top story, House of Representatives passes supplementary appropriations bill. I am Chris Ann Mitchell saying thank you for joining us.